Everybody knows Kermit Weeks. I, I think this one's working the best right here. One, two. There we go. Great. Uh, tell us about your albatross, and you're going to run it here for us. Yeah, yeah right? we'll do that. We'll uh, listen to me talk less, and we'll let, let us talk more. Uh, Kermit, you've been involved in lots and lots of airplanes. What, what's your passion for these World War I airplanes? Um, actually, World War I airplanes got me into aviation. Uh, my first model uh, magazine I bought had a Fokker triplane on the front, a little RC deal. I got into models. Um, heard that song, Snoopy and the Red Baron, when I was 13 in 1966. Yes, I am now a senior citizen. And uh, I basically uh, got fascinated with World War I airplanes, eventually got into World War II airplanes as well. So. Uh, everything in between. Um, everybody knows this is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, 1918-2018. It's also the 100th anniversary of the RAF. Uh, my guys, uh, we brought four airplanes up here, very highly, uh, uh, you know, authentic uh, World War I uh, reproductions, replicas, whatever it, you know, what you want to call them. But they've all got original engines. We've got the Albatross here. There's a Fokker D7 with a black and white striped wing over there, and the Pup and the Snipe. Sopwiths are sitting over here right now. Um, and uh, basically, the, uh, this particular airplane was the last of the Albatross series. Uh, they all had the Mercedes engine. This is an original World War I Mercedes engine. This particular one is 200 horsepower. They started with 160 horsepower. The airplane looks very fast. It's very streamlined. But don't let it fool you. It's not that fast. <laughs> I think it probably goes about 85 or 90 or something. Um, over on this side over here, if you get a chance to come up close, you can actually see the airspeed indicator is a little cupped anemometer. So if you want to see the airspeed, you actually have to look out uh, to the right wing. I find it's easier just to do this. Um, but basically, you kind of get the feel of the airplane for where it's at. I, I never look at the airspeed indicator. Um, also, some other interesting things is the fact that the radiator is in the wing right here, and everybody knows that there's less pressure on the top than there is on the bottom, so that makes it efficient, so the air flows up through the radiator. And there's a little handle in the back there, and if I want to adjust the radiator shutters, which I can see, all I do is stick my hand out the cockpit and move the louvers. And if you get a chance uh, to look here as well, these are the radiator pipes that come up. They go up to the radiator, and sticking out one of them there is actually the radiator temperature gauge. So the airspeed indicator, the temperature gauge, and the shutters are all outside the cockpit. Um, this airplane was built by uh, the Vintage Aviator Limited, which is Peter Jackson's company down in uh, New Zealand. Peter is a god in this World War I thing. He has put so much effort and so much money into this that uh, he, he's going to be praised for a very, very long time. Uh, and they didn't just build one. I did a trade for this and the Snipe. Uh, the TVAL guys built uh, this airplane and my Snipe over there. We did a trade, and uh, they overhauled my engines for me, uh, which was part of, the, of another deal. But anyway, they're just two awesome airplanes. And obviously, it, uh, it makes sense that if you're going to build one to build a, f a few more. I think they probably put together maybe a dozen of these so far. I've been very fortunate to, f to, to fly this one. I've flown some of the other ones in the air shows in New Zealand. Of course, everybody knows uh, prior to about 1928, the Lindbergh period, the airplanes had no brakes. So the only way the airplane slows down is with a skid in the back, which drags through the grass. And I think these airplanes are designed a little bit, they put the, the wheels a little bit forward more than you would like on a Piper cover or something to give a little bit of extra weight back there. And you can see my guys grunt and groan when we have to pick the tail wheel up, tail skid up and put it on the dolly, you know. So we've got custom dollies that we've made to, to move the airplanes around. Um, if you get a chance to come up and look at the details, Peter and myself, you know, we try to strive to a very high degree of authenticity. And if you come up here, not they, this fabric doesn't exist anymore. If you see a lot of the kind of the home-built type World War I airplanes, they paint that pattern on. But originally, it was printed on the fabric. It was an early form of camouflage. And, uh, and it also cut down the production time because they weren't worried about the airplanes lasting long to put a bunch of silver dope on it for UV protection. Uh, the reason we're not flying this is because the UV got to it and the fabric's not, not any good to fly anymore. But uh, this was printed on, and then all they had to do is sew it up, tighten it up with the dope, and it was out the door. So, but if you look on the Fokker D7, that thing came out with... Uh, uh, the lozenge fabric, this camouflage deal. And then when I got to the front, all the guys would take the big brushes and put all their you know, fancy paint jobs on it. And, and then the camouflage uh, concept went out the window. Um, 
And then uh, one other little thing to look at is these little nails in here that are they're all basically hold the till the glue dries. The glue is what actually holds the structure. These are all hand cut nails from Germany, which is what they originally did. So uh, my uh, compliments to Peter and his crew for doing a lot of research and detail and. Uh, if you want, I will run the engine. Does that sound good? That sounds so, good. What we're going to do right now to start this, Paul is up there. There's six priming cups on each cylinder. We're actually going to squirt. This is how you got to start the engine. We're going to squirt fuel into each one of the cylinders. We're going to close the cups. There's a cam lifter up there, which he's going to lift up. I'm going to get in the cockpit, and I've got a throttle, which is actually on the control column, not on the side. And uh, I've got a booster mag that I can spin, which will put spark whether the engine's running or not. And I've got a retard advance lever in there. So I'm going to go to the retard position. I'm going to put the mags on when Ken gets the prop in the correct position. And if everything works good, sometimes we don't have to prop this. If I spin it, it may start on its own. We'll give it about three tries. If it doesn't, we'll prop it, and you can hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Kermit. This is very special. The Albatross. Kermit Weeks, has, uh, as you know, has been very generous to EAA and has helped keep all these airplanes alive. We're so appreciative of him taking time to be here today. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Kermit. Amazing. It has electric start. Cool. Yeah, I don't know. I forgot to mention, but all the rocker uh, arms are exposed up there, so you can actually see the valves going up and down while you're flying. Um, you get a little bit of, it's got a, an oil uh, pump in it, you know, it has a, a normal oil system, so it gets lubricated up there. So when you're flying, it basically, uh, you know, comes back on the windscreen. So anytime I fly any of these old airplanes, I always got a lot of rags in the cockpit. Does anybody have a question real quick? Any questions, folks, for Kermit? Yes, sir. The periscope thing on the radiator, what it is, is it's, uh, you'll fill it up, and so what that little cup does up there, it basically kind of puts pressure on it. But if you have a boil over, 
it goes, it bats where it boils out. So it's above the radiator, so it's got some, a little bit of expansion space for the water. And when they first built it, they put the radiator in the middle of the wing. Guess what? That wasn't a very good idea. <laughs> so they moved it to the side so it wouldn't get in the pilot's face. Uh, Kermit, a lot of changes going on down at Fantasy of Flight. What's the circumstances now? Uh, can the public I, come? Go yeah, ahead. yeah, we've got just a little, the little white hanger. We've got the gift shop open. People can come. It's basically to keep our toe in the water and have a gift shop open to maintain my trademark status and to keep my sign out on the interstate. Uh, but what we're doing, I'm in the design development with some top theme park guys. My right-hand guy was the lead designer for all the Universal Studios parks on the planet. Uh, Bob Ward and we're basically coming up with a whole new concept in themed entertainment and when Fantasy of Flight reopens the airplane guys are going to love it because the airplanes are going to be there but it's actually not about the airplanes anymore. Um, I'm creating a concept where the aviation enthusiasts can see what they're going to what they expect but they're going to get a lot more and go away with oh my god that's pretty cool nobody but Kermit would do that but everybody else that's not on this airport right now that doesn't like airplanes is going to love the concept so I'm creating a win and then when they leave they're going to go oh those old airplanes are pretty cool so I'm hopefully going to create a win-win situation and give me about three years and Kermit uh, in your spare time uh, children's books. You're doing a series of children's books, is that right? I have children's books and I have my own private label rum brand now and I'm into balance and they both are 1995. Uh, what about these young people? We need to get young people in this. How do well, we do that? Well, you know, I don't know that it's so much we need to get young people into it because, you know, everybody is into some sort of eclectic organization. We, we preach to the choir, build icons of what we think is cool, and we force feed people information we think they ought to know. But what you got to do is you got to find a way that engages people and allow people to be themselves. You know, you know, maybe we're a bunch of old farts, you know, from back in the uh, time and whatever, you know. So we need to find a way to use it to inspire the kids to do things. It's not, you know, teaching them the way we grew up. It's allowing them to grow up in the way that, you know, they can make their own memories. Kermit, so, thank you. Kermit, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much.